Republican convention is attended by former Vice President Richard Nixon and Governor Nelson Rockefeller as they help choose a senatorial candidate. Also on hand is one-time presidential candidate Thomas Dewey. Before nominations are called for, the convention hears Claire Booth's loose plead for unity. She was to have run as a conservative, but withdrew to throw her support to Senator Kenneth Keating. Senator Keating has refused to endorse the Goldwater Miller ticket, but New York State Republicans nominate him by acclamation. The New York senatorial race has drawn national interest, for opposing Mr. Keating is a famous name. When the Democrats meet at convention the next day, the supporters of Samuel S. Stratton for the nomination stage a noisy demonstration. But they are swamped by the forces behind the candidacy of Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy. There have been cries of carpetbagger from the GOP, for Mr. Kennedy took up residence in New York to run for the office. He wins the nomination on the first ballot, and Mayor Robert Wagner, a principal backer, introduces the candidate to the convention. An outlander to Republicans and a political giant to Democrats, Mr. Kennedy begins a campaign that will be watched from coast to coast. A man who became a legend in his own lifetime is dead. Sergeant Alvin Cullen York came out of the Tennessee Hills in World War I and despite religious scruples went into the army and came out a hero. A hero who was to remain a modest man to the end of his 76 years. When the war broke out, young Alvin York was swinging a pick on a road gang. He was inducted and assigned to the 82nd Division and he quickly made a name for himself with his marksmanship. Sergeant York shot his way into history when he captured or killed an entire German machine gun battalion of 160 men, and he did it single-handedly. Sergeant York was the first common soldier to become a national hero. He refused to be exploited and turned down offers of lecture tours and books to devote himself to his beloved mountain people. He said, this uniform ain't for sale. Honor upon honor was bestowed on the doughboy who had married his childhood sweetheart. Always welcomed to the White House with his family, Sergeant York received more than 50 high honors from his own nation and foreign governments. But he continued to farm and hunt and to teach Sunday school to the Hill children. One of his last public appearances was when he received a citation from the Gold Star Mothers. He was modest as always. It certainly is an honor to receive this uh, presentation from the Gold Star Mothers of the World War, whom we uh, love so dearly, me and my comrades. And I accept this not only for myself, but for all of my buddies who were in the World War. I thank you. Landing at the airport in Rome is a cargo of beauties decked out in new blouse styles that are aimed at accenting the new fall fashions. When in Rome, do as the tourists do. Go to see the sights and to be seen and to be seen in finery that will turn many a man's head. Pat and Grace display two spirited blouses. Pat wears duotone stripes with a new high pan collar. She says it has the feel and the fit of an expensive shirt at pizza prices. Grace brings a softly draped ascot shirt to Rome. It's available in white or misty pastels. Just the thing to stop traffic on the Via Veneto. A tour of the ancient city calls for a relaxing cruise on a tree-framed lake. What more apt than these ship and shore creations go afloat? Judy sports a pleated fan frill shirt in which she claims a vested interest. Adrian flaunts her best bib and tucker, a ruffled white bib against pencil stripes. As you can imagine, the girls had little trouble in conquering Rome. They knew they were a success when the Italian Navy set out in pursuit. The 39th renewal of that classic of harness racing, the Hamiltonian, draws nearly 40,000 to the fairgrounds at Decoin, Illinois. The favorite is Ayers, a tiny bay with blistering speed. Directly back of the pace car, he almost breaks as they get away smoothly. Johnny Simpson straightens him out quickly, and the field of nine pounds around the mile track in the first of three scheduled heats. As they come down the stretch, Ayers is let loose by Simpson, 
and the crowd sees his number seven bob to the front in the middle of the track. As they pound for home, the time is phenomenal, and Ayers is heading for a new Hamiltonian record and a tie with the world mark. When the tiny 900-pounder hits the wire, his time is an unbelievable 156 and four-fifths. He goes on to win the second heat easily and chalks up his 10th victory of the year. They reserve the page in the record book for Ayers, the tiny mite with a great big heart.